it is a I, I throw a, a seven five heavy with a a moderate tip so it's a big rod now this is a little bit like if i was gonna throw if i was gonna throw a frog over say like if i had if i was on gunnersville and i had just acres of matted hydrilla and i was the frog was going to be coming the fish was going to be coming through the mat to eat the frog and i was going to have to fish him out of the mat i would throw this rod right here this is a seven six heavy with a stiff tip i mean it's just a seven six broomstick is what it is or even a bigger seven eight or seven something like that i would throw the just a big stiff rod the only time i'm gonna fish a frog on that like i say is if i'm throwing it over mats where the fish are actually coming through the mat to eat the frog and i'm having to get the fish out of the mat out here lake fork and most of the frog fishing that most people are going to do most places you might have it over some grass but a lot of times your bites are going to come on the edge of grass okay and you're going to have to work that frog in a little bit of open water in that case for working the frog purposes along with for hook setting purposes excuse me i want to have a 7.5 heavy or 7.4 heavy with a moderate tip they make one at six cents it's a 7.5 heavy with a moderate tip that to me is perfect Huh? Lux series. Yes, sir. Lux series. Yeah. Well, here's one thing. So when it comes to rod selection and how much money you spend on rods, <clears throat> spending money on expensive rods, it can be a, a, a very important upgrade to your fishing equipment. If you're going to drop shot, if you're going to Texas rig, uh, if you're going to fish a, you know, deep water dragon bait, a football jig, a Carolina rig, flipping a jig, you know, things like this where you're actually going to be holding the rod and feel the tunk. Those type of techniques is a very important to if you can you don't have to but if you can it's very helpful to spend money on more expensive rods with better blanks uh, the sensitivity matters in those techniques i don't need not that this rod's not sensitive because i've fished a lot of dragon techniques with lux rods i fish a carolina rig on a lux rod right now and they are very good rods so i'm not knocking them but you, you don't need sensitivity to fish a frog <laughs> like you don't need to feel the bite you see it, you know what I mean? So it doesn't matter how well you feel it. So uh, if you're gonna spend some extra money on rods and you're kind of trying to do it on a budget, don't spend it on your frog rod. But do get you one that has some tip. Get one that has a moderate tip in the 7.475 range. I, like I said, I like the 7.5 heavy with a moderate tip. Uh, Ronnie throws a 7.4 heavy with a moderate tip in his, in his rod as well, I know. Um, there's some really key components to that being able to work the bait correctly and we'll talk about how we work those baits here in a little bit but getting that bait to have the subtle darting dancing and just really the subtle sharp movements that will make a fish bite when it doesn't want to that tip's really important for that setting the hook on a frog when you've got braid and you've got no give setting the hook on that uh having a little bit of tips going to help you there as well maybe the most important part because a lot of our frog fish are caught in this much water Maybe the most important part about that soft tip is it's gonna enable you to cause that frog to land softly. You know what I'm saying? Like when you just bomb a frog out there and you just kind of let it hit, it's like and the water splashes away. Well, when you can kind of roll cast a frog up tight to cover and you can kind of feather it in there, thumb that spool a little bit, slow it down before it hits the water and it lands nice and soft. I can't tell you how many more frog bites that you will get if you land that frog soft next to cover. I mean, it'll, it'll be one of them deals a lot of times where you, if you land it in there real soft and you twitch it once and boom, he's got it, that happens. And if you splash it, that fish will spook sometimes. And so that tip, I know I'm talking a long time about the tip of the rod, but it's a very important factor when you're frog fishing. Uh, as far as a reel, you want a high speed gear ratio reel. Seven, eight to one, however you want to do it. Uh, the one I set it up on today, this is a loose Super Duty with an eight to one gear ratio. This is a little bit heavier reel than I would want to be throwing a frog on all day. But like I said, I didn't have my preferred frog set up. It was sitting in my garage. I like to throw it on a Team Lose light speed spool. It's a new reel they came out with this year that is probably, no exaggeration, I fished a lot of loose reels. It's probably my favorite reel I've ever fished of any brand ever. The Team Lose Light Speed Spool, L-I-T-E. It's a silver reel with some gold trim, cork handles. Uh, it just casts, and every customer, everybody that's put it in their hands, is, everyone up to a T has commented like, man, this thing throws it like it can cast it. Uh, I've been using that on my frog ride. I've been using that on some of my swim bait rods. It's, it's a really, really good reel. Um, Line, I use 50 pound braid. Now, a lot of guys will tell you to use 65. For me personally, 65 is overkill. Like, I don't have a problem breaking off on 50 pound braid. Like, I don't, I just don't. 
And some guys say that they do. I think that their guides are nicking up their braid or something. They got like a cut in there. You know what I mean? Like, I really think they do have like damaged guides or soft guides that are getting grooves in them that are nicking their braid. Because I've never had a problem. I use the regular cheap Power Pro 50 pound braid. It's like well rope, man. I, I've never had any issues breaking off on it. So to me, 65 seems like overkill. Um, 50 in the wind can be a little bit easier to throw and cast than 65 is. In uh, the, you know, 50 will actually cut grass better. This is kind of a misconception about braid. People say braid cuts grass, it does cut grass. But the smaller your braid is, the thinner your diameter, the better it will actually cut the grass. Now, you go to getting out in 30 and 20 pound braid, you can have some break offs on big fish and heavy vegetation. But the smaller your braid diameter is, so the smaller your pound test is, the smaller your diameter will be, it will cut through the grass better. It's like, if you've got a wedge, it's kind of hard to cut something. But if you got a little knife, it'll slice through something, right? So the thinner the diameter, the easier it cuts the grass. So 50 to me seems to be the right number. That's, that's the line that I use. As far as I think probably what you guys probably are going to get the most out of or want to hear the most, or I think this would be what it is, is how to work the frog to make them bite. There's a lot of different ways to fish a frog. The frog that I'm using now is this Six Cents Vega frog. It's new to this year. I'll pass a couple of these packages around, let y'all look at them. Uh, this frog has been really, really good. It was, I had a prototype in my hands for a long time. It's been very much anticipated by a lot of people that follow Six Cents. It took a long time for it to get here. That's a brand new one out of the box right there. Um, yeah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> What? I knew that was coming. But if you take a look at that frog, and David, you can kind of show some of this stuff off to the camera. The hook sits further back on the body than what you're used to seeing on most of your frogs. It's got a longer hook on it. The body's very soft. So between that hook positioning and the body being soft, the hookup ratio is tremendous on this frog. It has a little weight on the belly where the hook splits. That helps that frog pivot and walk. And the body is also a little bit longer and thinner than most of your other popping frogs, which also, again, having that longer body helps it walk. It's got a V-shaped bottom. All this stuff is designed to make it walk. It, I promise you've never fished a frog that walks as good as that one right there does. That's you haven't. True. It'll just turn on a dime. With the easiest twitch, it'll turn on a dime. Now, it's also got a, uh, a, a popping mouth, so you can you know pop it and spit water, depending on how you fish it. Um, you can walk it. And you can do a couple other things that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Did you have a question, sir? I saw your hand go up. Color. That one's black. That's, oh, what is the color name on that? Uh, it's just black. <laughs> it's black. Um, black. But are you asking what color do you, yeah, should you throw? So I throw, I throw black and white, and their <laughs> colors are black and ivory white. And I also throw natural colors, which, here, I'll pull this one out and let you see this one. Um, Next year, I will start that way. That's right, that's right. <laughs> this one's called Frogville, and this is kind of a more natural color. That was one brand new out of the box. This is one I fished. It's kind of got the legs trimmed, the hooks bowed out a little bit the way I do that. So you can take a look that. at that. Yeah, that, yeah. That one's called, rest of, not that one. yeah, that one's called Frogville. Uh, they've, you know, for me, what I need, I need three things. I need three frog colors. I need a black, I need a white, and then I need some type of natural color. And, and that's my natural color for a frog. Um, and then you know what, I do have a fourth frog color. I'll use like a, uh, a nat more natural shad pattern frog, like a gray or a silver, something like that, uh, in the spring of the year. When bass are on beds, man, shad, a lot of brim have pale bellies. I'll use something with like some blue and some silver and some, some, some natural shad or bluegill colors in the spring. But for most of the year, it's white, black, and natural frog. That's, that's the three colors I use. In the spring, we'll, we'll throw natural bait fish colors. Um, yeah, it's a really good frog. And any of that stuff from Six Cents, you know, I'm sure most of you guys know this. SixCentsFishing.com is linked in the description of every video we make. And uh, you can go there, and if you order something there, punch in the code, your Lake Fork Guide, and you get a 10% discount on anything you order. All right, let's talk about how we work the frog. So this is going to get a little complex, I guess. Wait, let's back up for a second. Yeah. You made a good point a while ago on about the rods. Yeah. And... Uh, <clears throat> Spending a lot more money on a rod at my age, you get a rod like that that is more expensive. A lot of time it's lighter. A yes. 40 ton composite will be a lot lighter and you get a reel. Is that light reel you're talking about? For, uh, was Is it naturally lighter? Oh, yeah. Itself? It's super so, light. It's uh, like five, five point something ounces. Weight <laughs> wise, yeah. 
and especially if you're not throwing frogs every day, whew, well, that elbow and that wrist yeah. will be taxed severely so, when you're working those things. So if you've got a rig like that, that is naturally has weighs less ounces than, a, say, a heavier rod, at the end of the day, you're going to be way more thankful. Yep. If you're having to live with a frog bite, having a lot of hookups and things are blowing up, and, uh, I mean, you'll be thanking yourself for getting it. 100% for sure. This is actually my punching setup. And the reason why is this reel is a little bit heavier. But this reel has oversized gears, oversized handles, which is great for punching. That's what I want for punching. And when you're punching, you're just flipping like this. You're not making big cash. You're not working it. You're just doing this and holding it. Doing this. And, you know, you're not doing a lot. With you, so you can afford to use a little bit heavier gear. But what David's saying, having that light reel having that light rod, which the Lux rods are very light, and the 7.5 that I use is even a little bit lighter than the 7.6 Heavy, and then having that super light reel, that Team Lose Light weighs, I wanna say it's 5.7 ounces. It's one of the lightest reels on the market. Really, really good. Um, yeah, that's important. When you're working a bait like this, like when you're fishing a jerk bait, or you're fishing a topwater walking bait, or for all, anything that you're doing this with, if that reel is heavy at all, you're gonna be hurting, absolutely hurting. So. Yep, all right, retrieves. First, let's talk about casts. So to get that soft landing that we're talking about, which, you know, when we're fall frog fishing, like I said, in the beginning of the seminar, the water can fall sometimes in the fall. Lake Fork has been falling pretty fast here lately. Lots of grass from summer growth. So as that water falls, all that grass really gets matted up and you just get junk. You get, you know, some bushes that are still in the water. You get lily pads that are now hanging sagging down on the water you get palm weed that's really starting to get dense in the shallow water and coontail hydrilla you name it i was at a lake earlier this week had mill full in it it's all matting up everywhere you go in the fall um so you got all these options up shallow where these fish have these great cover opportunities great ambush opportunities and a frog can get into all of them you can skip it under bushes you can skip it under docks you can throw it on top of the grass mat and fish it fine like you can throw like i love fishing frogs with customers because when they screw up and throw it in the tree they can just reel and it comes out it's great it's great you know what i mean like you throw a frog yeah right you throw a frog wherever you want to it's coming back to you it's a wonderful thing um but to make that bait land next to cover accurately and softly first don't necessarily get caught up on trying to make big super long casts it's good to stay as far away from the fish as you can absolutely but you don't have to those fish are cover related they're ambush related and if something comes in their territory and it looks somewhat natural they're going to react and bust it especially if you can feather it in there nice and tight um, and soft so the cast that i'm using is a roll cast everybody experienced that before everybody's done that before it's a roll cast. I don't want to throw it overhand. I'm not flipping or pitching because I want to cast it out there. But I'm using a roll cast. And basically what I'm trying to do, and this ain't going to show up on camera worth a darn, but you guys here in the audience will get to see it. So what I'm going to try to do is as I cast that frog, let's say the water level's, you know, the floor, I'm trying to get that frog traveling as close to that water, parallel with it for as long as possible before I release it. That's going to allow that frog to fly low to the water. And then the other key component, and that tip's going to help you whip it out there like that. The other key component is, once you've got that reel going, shh, when it's going out there, you want to lightly feather your spool to a stop. You do not, most, a lot of baits, we wait till right when the bait hits the water to stop the spool with our thumb, right? You want to feather that to a stop. You want to slow it down as it gets to the water. And if it's low and you slow it down before it hits, it will almost set on the water sometimes with, I mean, hardly a ripple at all. I mean, it'll really, you can see how that works in your mind. It'll really land soft. Now, that is something that is going to take an immense amount of repetition to master. And you're not always going to get it right. I mean, it's going to take you a long time to learn how to do that. Um, but having that tip is going to help you tremendously cushion that blow as it goes in the water. All right, so now we've got a good, soft, accurate cast. How are we going to work the frog to get bites? few different th things you can do. So if you want to fish, like if you're seeing a lot of chasing activity along the grass edges, right? You're seeing shad running, you're seeing bass wake after them and really chase after them hard. When that happens, the first thing I'm gonna do, I wanna fish this frog fast. I want it to have sudden erratic darts and twitches and I want it to keep moving and I want the overall movement to be fast. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to throw that bait out there. And I'm going to point my rod straight down in front of me. I'm going to twitch, 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 twitch. I'm just going to sit here and twitch my wrist. I'm going to twitch it fast, and that frog, especially with this frog that walks so easy, is going to go. It's just going to skitter across the top. But you're just the key is to point directly at it with your rod pointed down and twitch the rod down as fast as you can. Just, just like that right there. That little motion right there will make that frog go crazy and it'll run across the surface it's like a bait fish skittering across the top trying to get away and if those bass if their instincts and what's going on in the water column that day is telling them to chase like that they'll come chase that bait and you better have a hold of that rod when they hit it because when it's fast like that they hit it going the other way <laughs> they'll jerk it out of your hands if you're not careful sharp hooks you see that mm, sharp so, hooks yeah. uh, i think the second one that most people do is walking the frog walking a frog or walking a topwater walking bait like a zero spook. Yep, it, it's it's simple, but man, there's a lot of people who have a tough time executing it. The key is if I cast the bait this way right here, like if I cast straight towards the Texas flag over there, y'all, everybody see the Texas flag? If I cast straight towards that, I can't point my rod at the Texas flag. I need to point my rod kind of at a 45, at close to a 45 as I can get within my boat from the Texas flag. So if my bait's over there, my rod's pointing here. Now I'm going to get a little bit of slack in my line, and I'm going to twitch my slack. Now when I say twitch my slack, a lot of people have this problem. They'll go to twitch. And right here, their line's tight, and they keep pulling to here. Well, that's going to make that frog just lunge forward. And then it'll turn a little bit, but it won't really get the walking effect that you're looking for. But if when you hit the end of your twitch, if that's the same time that you snap the end of that slack, that frog's going to go. And then you do it again. And one thing you'll notice, the rod butt is hitting my forearm. Y'all see that? So I'm going to stand there in the boat, and I can't get quite a sharp angle down as I can because i got a floor here. But I'm going to sit there like this. That's kind of the rhythm. If I'm on the walk frog, that's what I'm going to do. See that rod butt hitting my... Now, if you watch from that rod tip, when I, when I slap the butt of that rod on my forearm, see how the rod tip bounces back towards the frog? So what that's going to do is you're snapping in that slack. The rod butt's pointing back, creating the slack that allows it to turn. Gets tight. It makes the frog go this way. Then the rod butt slapping back creates the slack, and that makes the frog turn. That's with a Zara spook. That's with a yellow magic. That's with anything you're trying to walk. You've got to get the line snapped tight, and create slack in an instant. And hitting your rod butt on your forearm really helps you do that a lot. It makes that rod naturally bounce back towards the bait. You don't have to worry about trying to think about that. So that's a great uh, technique tip on walking forearm right there. The feel for hitting the end of your slack right at the end of your pop, again, that's repetition. You're gonna have to learn how to do that. That's where the people that I see that struggle as guide customers struggle is they're pulling, most of the time, they're pulling the, the slack out of the bait, not popping the slack. That, does that make sense? Okay. Now, how do we make these fish bite when we don't see activity? But man, it's like water's 70 degrees. It's late October. There's some shad up on the bank. Don't see no bass chasing them. How do we make them bite? Man, hey, I've tried running it. I've tried walking it. I've tried just slow popping it. Slow pop Can't get them to bite. How do I make them bite it? Well, here's the deal, guys. If there's a bunch of shad on the bank, I mean a bunch, if there's an immense amount of shad on the bank and it's October, November in East Texas, 100,000%, there's bass on shallow cover. They're up there. Whether you're catching them or not, they are up there, right? I promise you. And 100,000%, if you throw your frog and the fish is up there, he's looking at your frog. He is looking at it. He may choose not to bite it because you're just kind of steady walking it or you're fishing it too slow. He's not reacting to that. You gotta make that fish react. So when we're fishing a crankbait and it goes, that's that fish watching that crankbait and when it lunges, that fish lunges too, right? Or if we're fishing a chatterbait or lipless crankbait and it hits grass and stops and then spurts out of there and they eat it in the wintertime when they don't wanna eat nothing because they react to that sudden change of movement. There's a way to do that with a frog. Most of the time we fish a frog pretty steady cadence like this or pretty steady cadence like this or a pop, pop, pause. It's all pretty rhythmic and steady for most of your retrieves with a frog. Um, the more erratic you can get, the better chance you, make, you have of making a really big fish, a really big fish, react violently to your frog. And one way to do that is once you've mastered twitching the end of your slack, if you'll do that as violent as you can, as fast as you can for two to four pops in a row, that frog will go and dive under and pop back up. 
and it'll make a sound at times it almost sounds like there's like you'll do it and you'll be like did one hit it it's just the sound you're making that frog move so violently and suddenly that it sounds like a fish is blowing up on it because that frog's swirling in the water and diving and going under and making all kinds of weird noises and it creates a suction sound it sounds like one's trying to hit your frog nothing there it's just the frog but if you don't think that'll make a bass that's sitting there looking at that and he sees that crazy movement and that noise you don't think that'll make them react like it'll make i mean it's a it's a violent deal like you throw it out there and you got it and you're like i can't even do it in here i'll do it up here i mean you snap it you're pop, pop, pop. you're snapping it two or three times as hard as you can and you're really just trying to make that frog go choo, choo, choo. and that's what it does and i'll give full credit to ronnie kelly on that he was the first one i seen working like that and he was a guy that i said He's making fish bite that frog that nobody else that I know is making them bite it by making that movement right there. Another way that I've kind of found on my own that's pretty good is y'all remember earlier that quick running in front of you, twitching running. So that deal where we do it constant when they're really chasing, a lot of times you can do start stop versions of that to make them react. I love that this time of year. That one I just showed you, I really, really like that one better in the springtime when I feel like fish are sitting like this when they're around a the bed and they're just sitting dead still. They're not wandering. You know, even fall fish that are inactive are kind of cruising, right? But in the springtime, when they're on beds, they're just, that's when I really like that. Cause that, if that happens over their head, it, they blow up on it, right? But when they're already moving and wandering, I need a, something that moves a little bit more, but still has some suddenness to it to make them react. So I'll take that quick sputter, just and then stop. And then maybe give it one pop. Mm, come back at them right just be creative sometimes being creative is the way to fish a frog in the fall and make them react i'll do that a lot though a little i'll do those quick twitches where it runs and walks real fast and then stops and then hit it with one hard pop and that sucker will turn around and look at them and then i'll start walking it again and a lot of times your bite's going to come you're going to twitch 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 stop make it turn around and it's going to get their attention and as soon as you start to sputter it away like it's running away from them man they'll come unglued on it uh but you got to make them bite you know if you Sometimes they don't want you to make them bite and you just need to walk it and they'll eat it. And that, there's a time and place for that as well. But if you're out there fishing a frog and you're finding that you're not getting bites when you really feel like you should be getting bites on a frog, try some of those sudden ways or get creative with your own. Make them react. Think about reaction baits that we fish. Think about stroking a jig. Think about ripping baits out of grass. Think about crankbaits. Think about those type of reactions that you get on other techniques and try to make that fish react to a frog the way you make it react to other baits. Because we all know most days they're not really biting that good. Most days we're having to make these fish bite either by putting something in their face for so long, finesse wise, they decide to eat it something that'll stay in their face forever. They decide to eat it because it's in their face for so long and it's finesse and it's non-threatening, no negative cues. Or we're making them react to something that's kind of power fishing, violent movement, reaction type baits. Not many days you just go out there and throw it and wind it and you catch a bunch. You usually have to make them bite. Vegetation, you go scouring around the lake and different kinds of vegetation on the lake can have different effect on how, what that frog and how it's gonna work. You know, I mean, there's there's perfect scenarios out there where you got some real loose, uh, even coontail grass is an excellent choice for, especially when it's real shallow. Naturally, it'd be a hard play if it was hyacinths. You know, so yeah. there's different vegetations that you look at, and then if it's scattered out a little bit, that makes it yeah. even better. So let me let me add something to what David just said there. So everything that I just talked about on retrieve techniques was specifically for the situation that we face out here, which is most of your frog bites and most of your frog working is going to be in water not on a mat this those were not techniques to fish on top of matted vegetation those were techniques to fish on edges and in front of vegetation which is what we face a lot more of out here than matted there is times to fish matted vegetation out here um, and I know I said that the vegetation is getting matted. It is, but it's getting matted on the bank. It's not, we don't have matted hydrilla in eight foot of water. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist out here on Lake Fork right now. It'd be wonderful if it did, right? We'd all be a lot happier if it did, but it doesn't, it doesn't. And so we're not talking about fishing these frogs on top of mats. That's a whole different ball game, fishing them on top of mats. Yeah, because uh, interesting, we were fishing that type of scenario two days ago and we were going along and I'm noticing up in the mat, every now and then, something would mm -hmm. roll up. And I saw that several times. 
thinking about that. I dug in the box, dug out a frog, and the guy that was in the front, he said, here, throw that. And so he throws it up there on the mat, way back up on the back side. This of the is mat. on a different lake. And it's on a different lake, yeah. not here. Yeah. And we're working it, working it, working it. And if you noticed, if you really look good, that there's, there's mat, but then there's loose mat. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't quite like this as much as it was like this, which all of a sudden made a difference. And he worked it through that, all of a sudden, boom. And he ended up having several bites because those fish were chasing and we noticed it. I noticed it as I looked down the line. And next thing you know, on a corner, and it was a corner, he throws that thing up there and a five pounder just absolutely destroyed it. And he, whoa, he was, he, he had that thing pinned in that. And then it comes back to the rod that he's talking about. He needed every bit of that telephone yeah. post to get that thing started. Yeah, back. when you told him to match, you need that didn't big come back. I mean, it did, the frog didn't come out of his mouth either. And when he got it up to the boat, I mean, I was picking, picking stuff off of it, trying to get it out of there just so we could dig the fish. Unwrapping Christmas presents. Unwrapping though. Christmas presents. Right. Yeah. Oh, hey. yeah. I'll tell you guys one, one key tip, probably the most important tip for, for fishing a frog on matted, true matted vegetation, Gunnersville. Some of Lake Welsh was where he's talking about. Like some of these lakes that get the real matted hydrilla at 8, 10, 12 foot of water or deeper. Uh, when you see those mats in the summertime, they'll start to develop that cheese on it. You know what I'm talking about? You'll get that inch, half inch thick layer of slime, frothy, thick, slimy stuff. Wherever it develops that cheese, right that's where you fish the frog when it has the cheese on it because what happens is that cheese blocks out a hundred percent of the sunlight and underneath is where that mat opens up underneath that cheese and those brim love to come up and eat that algae and that off that slime that is actually as the hydrilla grows up and becomes a mat it lays over the top layer of the hydrilla that can no longer continue to grow up because there's no more water will die from the heat in the summer that's when you get it, it's in the summertime. That is dead hydrilla. That slime, that cheese, it's dead hydrilla. And as it dies and starts to decompose back in the water, it thins the grass underneath it and the brim come up there and eat off of it. And those bass are sitting there looking at that at the top of that mat. When that brim's up there munching on that cheese at the top of that mat, that bass, when what David's seen in that mat, when, boom, they're eating a brim off the top of that mat. That's what they're doing. And so you want to fish your frog wherever you see that cheese or wherever when you get into the fall and the rain starts knocking that cheese off there where the mats thinned out, that, that's really where you want to fish that frog and that mat more than anywhere because that's where those brim have been eating that algae in that area of the mat. And the weird thing about the frog, I'm telling you how, how the way it works, we're back there the next day in that same area and I'm watching as we're going along, <laughs> not a single motion yeah. one. And yeah, but that was a sunny day versus a cloudy day. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. pulled out of the mat on the cloudy day. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was. Yep. And we had it out, and he was throwing it, throwing it, throwing it. And he had two little ones go after it, and that was it. You know, yeah. so what a difference it makes. Sunny days are... Uh, yeah, for matted stuff, the sunny days yeah, is the deal. Sunny days is the deal. 100%. Sunny days are the deal if you're fishing matted. Truly, like, underneath matted. If you're fishing underneath the mats, the, the sun is really important. I don't remember having very many good days on deep matted vegetation when, when it was cloudy. Any other questions on anything? Y'all want to know why David's so ugly? I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a beard. <laughs> oh, there it is. Because I cover up the uglies. <laughs> hey, this sucker's needed to be trimmed for a month and a half. And it, I'm telling you, even the beard's ugly at this point, brother. It's been a long couple of weeks here, I'm telling you. Hey, man, thank you guys so much. We see Officer Nick, one of our local law enforcement guys we sure appreciate him stopping by he does quite often and uh got to meet a couple guys i know one of them that i've seen his name on the comments on most of the stuff for a long time and got to meet him tonight for the first time so that was great i appreciate you coming out mr phelps and it was great to meet your friend as well um man i love doing these so if y'all are watching on the internet y'all are around lake fork two weeks from now come i believe two weeks from now we're gonna have our area biologist for lake fork is if we can get the schedule worked out. Right now, tentatively, he's told me yes. He wants to come. He's coming to one of these. I think it's going to be two weeks from now. The next seminar, Jake Norman, who's the biologist over Lake Fork, got appointed there about a year ago. Um, he's going to come talk to us about a lot of really good information. They got a great tracking survey. They got some fish out there running around like RoboCops with wires hanging out of them. Oh, and I was a part of that. I got to see that and in action. So, yeah, and I, I caught one of them and gave them the information on that. And uh, that's how me and Jake started talking. And he's a super nice guy. Um, 
I love Texas Parks and Wildlife. I believe we have the best wildlife department of any state in the country. I've also been pretty highly critical of some of the spraying and stuff that's gone on. Uh, me and Jake have talked momentarily about it, but we're going to have a good discussion about it when he gets here. We'll talk about all of it. And any question that you guys have about the science of bass fishing ecology, is that right? Sounds good to me. Biology. Bi well, yeah, what? <laughs> What, it's an ecosystem, right? Ecosystem. So, it, it, I got that right. I got that right. <laughs> Whew, Mama will be proud of that one, boys. I don't have to go back to school. Uh, yeah, he'll be here in two weeks, so I'm really looking forward to that. That should be a really interesting discussion and a very, very educational discussion, specifically for our region and, and Lake Fork specifically. So, uh, once again, thank you all for coming. Thank Lake Fork Marina, and we will see you guys in two weeks. Thank you very much.